Chapter 15 of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume 7. By John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 15 Maximilian. At the beginning of the year 1863, the French had made but little headway in their conquest of Mexico. They had an army of less than 30,000 men distributed from Veracruz to Orizaba and scattered about in other more or less important posts. The Mexicans had a force considerably larger than this. The greater part of their army was concentrated at Puebla, with all the points between that city and the capital strongly held, and a large reserve under Alvarez in the state of Guerrero. It was not until near the end of February that General Forêt felt strong enough to advance from Orizaba upon the capital. He had learned caution from his former misadventure, and now advanced in heavy force and with great circumspection, sending before him proclamations of the most pacific intentions. The national troops gathered to meet him with the best array that a distracted country could furnish, and by the middle of March the siege of Puebla was fairly begun. It took a month of fighting before the French had penetrated into the city, and even then their advance was disputed by the Mexicans from street to street, and almost from house to house, with the most desperate valor, and as late as the 25th of April the French received their severest repulse in the assault which they made upon the fortified convent of St. Inez. But on the 8th of May, General Comonfort, who commanded the cooperating force outside the city, was totally defeated by General Bazaine near the village of San Lorenzo, and driven away towards Mexico, leaving Forêt free to reduce Puebla at his leisure. The city fell on the 19th of May, after a laborious and costly siege of two months, the French capturing some 15,000 men, of whom 23 were generals. The Mexicans could not recover from this double defeat in time to oppose the triumphant march of the invaders. With Comonfort's army totally defeated, and Ortega's captured or disbanded, there was no possibility of interposing an effectual resistance to the advance on the city of Mexico, and on the 10th of June, Forêt entered the capital, amidst demonstrations of delight from the French population and the reactionary church party, which might well have deceived him in regard to the sentiments of the majority of the people. He issued a manifesto announcing that his mission had but two objects, one being the glory of the French arms, and the other the establishment in Mexico of a government which should practice justice, probity, and good faith in its foreign relations and liberty at home. But liberty, he gave it to be understood, walking in the path of order with respect for religion, property, and family. He at once organized, with the assistance of Monsieur de Saligny, his diplomatic colleague, a provisional government. He appointed a superior council of 35, which in turn elected a triumvirate, consisting of General Almonte, the Archbishop of Mexico, and General Salas, which formed the executive power. An assembly of notables was then called together, which convened on the 10th of July, and at once, with a unanimity rarely encountered off the stage, declared for an imperial government, and selected as emperor the Archduke Maximilian of Austria. The next month, an imposing deputation, at the head of which was Senor Gutierrez de Estrada, sailed for Europe, charged to tender the crown of Mexico to Prince Maximilian, and, in case of his refusal, to any one whom the Emperor of France should designate. General Forêt had done his work with only too much promptness and zeal. The demonstrations of joy and enthusiasm in favor of a new government, which he reported to the Emperor, had been too exclusively confined to the immediate neighborhood of his headquarters, and the Emperor of France could not but anticipate the derision of Europe at a revolution so fundamental, accomplished in so few days and in the shadow of so few bayonets. The junta, nominated by a French soldier, had appointed an executive power which, in turn, had called together an assembly of two hundred notables, who had, with absurd unanimity, founded without an hour's debate a new government and a new dynasty. The emperor, who had a passion for plebiscites, felt that this brusque handiwork of his soldiers needed the sanction of something which should at least appear like a popular vote, 
and he therefore instructed his general in Mexico, by a dispatch written on the same day the crown-bearing deputation sailed for Europe, that he accepted this action of the Assembly of Notables merely as a symptom of favorable augury. He regarded their vote as having no validity in itself, but simply as a recommendation to the real voters. Quote, it is now, he said, the part of the provisional government to collect these suffrages of the people in such a manner that no doubt shall hang over this expression of the will of the people of the country. End quote. The deputation arrived at the castle of Miramar, near Trieste, on the 3rd of October, and although every semblance of authority had been stripped from them by the emperor's dispatch, they still went through the form of offering to the archduke their visionary empire. Senor Gutierrez de Estrada, in a speech full of southern eloquence and extravagance, represented to Prince Maximilian the spontaneous and enthusiastic character of the call which came to him as the unanimous choice of the people of Mexico, and with that intimate knowledge of the designs of Providence, always assumed by the extremists of all parties, he warned him that in refusing the crown of Mexico he would be contravening the will of heaven, which had endowed him with the rarest and richest qualities for the express purpose of saving and regenerating Mexico. They then presented him, enclosed in the handle of a scepter of solid gold, the parchment upon which was engrossed the vote of the notables. The prince, who had received his orders from Paris, could not accept at once the glittering honors thus offered him. He declared that he must, in complete accord with the views of the Emperor Napoleon, insist that a monarchy could not be established on a legitimate and firm basis without a spontaneous expression of the wishes of the whole nation. He must also ask for guarantees which would be indispensable to secure Mexico against the dangers which threatened her integrity and independence. Should these conditions be fulfilled, and his brother, the Emperor of Austria, approve, he would then be ready to accept the crown. With this answer, the delegation was forced to be content, and returned to try to carry into effect the difficult conditions proposed by the Emperor of France. All through the summer and autumn, General Forêt, and after him General Bazin, continued their operations against the scattered and still struggling armies of Mexico. In November, the French forces moved towards the north. General Comonfort was killed by banditti, and General Uraga became general-in-chief. The Mexicans were not strong enough to risk at any time a general engagement, but endeavored to harass and impede as far as possible the march of the French. But the invaders constantly gained ground, so that on the 1st of January, 1864, they occupied most of the country from Mexico to San Luis Potosí on the north and Guadalajara on the west and on the east the country between Veracruz and the capital was entirely in their hands. It was not a large portion of the territory of the Republic, counted in square miles, but it was of great importance, comprising, as it did, some of the richest and most populous states and cities of Mexico. The course of events in Mexico was vigilantly watched by President Lincoln and the Secretary of State. On the 9th of August, at a time when General Grant, flushed with his triumph at Vicksburg, proposed an expedition to Mobile, the President, in a confidential letter to him, said, quote, This would appear tempting to me also, were it not that in view of recent events in Mexico, I am greatly impressed with the importance of re-establishing the national authority in western Texas as soon as possible. I am not making an order, however. That I leave, for the present at least, to the General-in-Chief, end quote. Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Seward observed with equal care the progress of events on our western frontier and in European courts. They did not consider themselves obliged, either by the traditions of American policy or by the necessities of the case, to do more than keep steadily before the eyes of European governments the adverse opinion of the United States in relation to the French invasion. But they did not fail to perform this duty with the utmost candor and firmness. In a long dispatch of the 26th of September, Mr. Seward gave a thorough explanation of the views of the President, which could have left no doubt on the mind of Napoleon III as to what he might ultimately expect in case of a prolonged war or a permanent occupation in Mexico. He refers to the non-intervention which the American government has practiced in every phase of the war, but at the same time insists upon the fact, which, he said, is known full well to the American government, quote, 
that the inherent normal opinion of Mexico favors a government there, republican in form and domestic in organization, in preference to any monarchical institutions to be imposed from abroad. End quote. He speaks of the interdependence of all the American republics upon each other, and says that the safety of the United States, quote, and the cheerful destiny to which they aspire are intimately dependent upon the continuance of free republican institutions throughout America. End quote. These opinions were worthy of the serious consideration of the Emperor of France in determining how he should conduct and close what might prove a successful war in Mexico. If France should, upon due consideration, determine to adopt a policy in Mexico adverse to the American opinions and sentiments referred to, that policy would probably scatter seeds which would be fruitful of jealousies which might ultimately ripen into collision between France and the United States and other American republics. He mentions in illustration of this various rumors already current in regard to the purposes of France in reference to Texas and the Missouri River, and to coalitions between the Regency established in Mexico and the insurgent cabal at Richmond. Quote, the President, said Mr. Seward, apprehends none of these things. He does not allow himself to be disturbed by suspicions so unjust to France and so unjustifiable in themselves, but he knows also that such suspicions will be entertained more or less extensively by this country and magnified in other countries equally unfriendly to France and to America, and he knows that it is out of such suspicions that the fatal web of national animosity is most frequently woven." End quote. He assumes that the emperor's intentions are as friendly as those of the president, and bases upon that assumption this sincere and earnest conversation. He closed by saying, quote, We ourselves, however, are not unobservant of the progress of events at home and abroad, and in no case are we likely to neglect such provision for our own safety as every sovereign state must always be prepared to fall back upon when nations with which they have lived in friendship cease to respect their moral and treaty obligations." End quote. These views were laid before the French Minister for Foreign Affairs by Mr. Dayton. M. de Rouen de Lui said that the dangers of the government of the Archduke would come principally from the United States, and the sooner we showed ourselves satisfied and manifested a willingness to enter into peaceful relations with that government, the sooner would theirs be ready to leave Mexico and the new government to take care of itself which France would, in any event, do as soon as it could, but that it would not lead or tempt the Archduke into difficulty and then desert him before his government was settled, a promise which, within a few years, was to figure strangely among the broken covenants of the Second Empire. Mr. Dayton intimated to him in reply that he could scarcely suppose that France, under the circumstances, would expect the United States to make haste to acknowledge a new monarchy in Mexico, but he promised to report the views of the minister to the government at home. By return of mail, Mr. Seward again set forth the sentiments of the president in a dispatch of singular moderation and firmness. He referred to the determination of the president to err on the side of strict neutrality, if he erred at all, in the war that is carried on between two nations with which the United States are maintaining relations of amity and friendship and also to the intimation of M. Drouin de Lui that an early acknowledgment of the proposed empire by the United States would assist to relieve France from her troublesome complications. And then he went on to say, quote, The French government has not been left uninformed that in the opinion of the United States the permanent establishment of a foreign and monarchical government in Mexico will be found neither easy nor desirable, end quote. He reiterated the purpose of the United States not to interfere with the free choice of the people of Mexico in the establishment or enjoyment of such institutions as they may prefer, but said, quote, It is also proper that M. de Rouen-de-Lui should be informed that the United States continue to regard Mexico as the theater of a war, which has not yet ended in the subversion of the government long existing there, and with which the United States remain in the relation of peace and sincere friendship and that for this reason the United States are not now at liberty to consider the question of recognizing a government which, in the further chances of war, may come into its place." End quote. It is probable that no one, now or in future, will question the wisdom or the equity of the attitude assumed and consistently maintained by the President and the Secretary of State in regard to the invasion of Mexico 
but in the mind of the stormy passions of that period they were subjected to severe criticisms and attack on the part of those who insisted that the moderation with which they held their ground in all their discussions with the french government amounted to a practical abandonment of what was loosely called the monroe doctrine it was the opinion of many that the government was recreant to its duty in not protesting against any european aggression upon an american republic and opposing such aggression even to the point of war this was carrying the doctrine of president monroe to a point far beyond the intentions of any of the early statesmen of the republic the text of the famous passage in president monroe's message of december second eighteen twenty three which is almost a repetition of the words employed by john quincy adams in a dispatch to mr rush the american minister in london and in a conversation with the russian minister in washington five months before is as follows quote, the occasion has been judged proper for asserting as a principle in which the rights and interests of the united states are involved that the american continents by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. End quote. And further, in the same message, the President said, quote, We owe it, therefore, to candor and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and these powers to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. End quote and referring to the american governments which had declared and maintained their independence he added quote, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other manner their destiny by any european power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the united states end quote. Two years later, when Mr. Adams, the true author of the Monroe Doctrine, if anyone can claim the authorship of a doctrine universally held by Americans then and since, had succeeded Mr. Monroe in the presidency, Henry Clay, his Secretary of State, in a dispatch to the American minister in Mexico, gave the idea a little further extension by adding to the text given above a second clause to the effect that the United States, while they did not desire to interfere in Europe with the political system of the Holy Alliance, would regard as dangerous to their peace and safety any attempt on the part of the allied european powers to extend their system to any part of america neither continent having the right to enforce upon the other the establishment of its peculiar system at the close of the same year mr adams in a message suggesting the propriety of having the united states represented at the congress of panama said quote, an agreement between all the parties represented at the meeting that each will guard by its own means against the establishment of any future european colony within its borders may be found advisable this was he adds more than two years since announced by my predecessor to the world as a principle resulting from the emancipation of both the american continents end quote. It was therefore in accordance not only with the dictates of a wise expediency but also in harmony with the established traditions of the government that the president contented himself with a firm repetition of the views and principles held by the united states in relation to foreign invasion and abstained from protests which would have been futile and ridiculous in his message of december eighteen sixty three at the opening of congress he entered into no discussion of the subject this occasioned a great disappointment among some of the more ardent spirits in congress and on the 11th of January, Mr. McDougall of California introduced into the Senate a resolution declaring that, quote, the occupation of a portion of the territory of the Republic of Mexico by the armed forces of the government of France is an act unfriendly to the Republic of the United States of America, end quote, that it was the duty of the American government to demand of France to withdraw its armed force from the Mexican territory within a reasonable time, and that failing this, quote, on or before the fifteenth day of march next it will become the duty of the congress of the united states of america to declare war against the government of france end quote. just one year before this mr mcdougall had introduced a set of resolutions of like purport which had been laid on the table on motion of senator sumner a similar fate awaited these belligerent propositions they were referred to the committee on foreign relations then as before under the judicious chairmanship of mr sumner and were not again reported to the senate but the committee on foreign affairs of the house of representatives had a chairman of very different temper from mr sumner henry winter davis who was equally distinguished for his eloquence and his ardor his tenacity of opinion and his impatience of contradiction 
Under his energetic leadership, the Committee of the House reported the following resolution, which was passed by an affirmative vote of 109, not a voice being raised against it. Quote, Resolved that the Congress of the United States are unwilling by silence to leave the nations of the world under the impression that they are indifferent spectators of the deplorable events now transpiring in the Republic of Mexico, and that they therefore think fit to declare that it does not accord with the policy of the United States to acknowledge any monarchical government erected on the ruins of any Republican government in America under the auspices of any European power. End quote. On arriving at the Senate, this resolution was referred to the Committee on Foreign Relations, where, in company with the more fiery utterances of Mr. McDougall, it slept unreported until the close of the session. The Minister of France in Washington lost no time in asking for an explanation of this vote, and on the 7th of April, Mr. Seward, in a dispatch to Mr. Dayton, said, quote, it is hardly necessary, after what I have heretofore written with perfect candor for the information of France, to say that this resolution truly interprets the unanimous sentiment of the people of the United States in regard to Mexico. End quote. He then goes on to say that the question of recognition of a monarchy in Mexico is an executive one, and that the decision of it constitutionally belongs not to the House of Representatives, nor even to Congress, but to the President of the United States that the joint resolution which had passed the House before it could receive a legislative character must pass the Senate and receive the approval of the President, that while the President received the declaration of the House of Representatives with the profound respect to which it was entitled, he directed Mr. Dayton to inform the government of France that he did not at present contemplate any departure from the policy which this government had hitherto pursued in regard to the war between France and Mexico, quote, that the proceeding of the House of Representatives was adopted upon suggestions arising within itself, and not upon any communication of the Executive Department, and that the French government would be seasonably apprised of any change of policy upon this subject, which the President might at any future time think it proper to adopt." End quote. But before this dispatch reached Paris, Mr. Dayton, visiting M. Douin de Lui, was greeted by him with the abrupt inquiry, Do you bring us peace or war? Mr. Dayton, not having received Mr. Seward's dispatch on the subject, was unable to answer, except in general terms, that there was nothing in the resolutions of the House at variance with the views constantly expressed in the official dispatches of the Secretary of State. M. Drouin de Lui evidently regarded the proceedings as entailing serious consequences, and Mr. Dayton reported that it was the occasion of great exultation and activity among the secessionists in Paris. When, a few days later, Mr. Dayton received Mr. Seward's dispatch of the 7th of April, and read it to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was able to report that the sensitiveness manifested by the government on the receipt of the news of the passage of the resolution had to a great extent subsided. The Moniteur announced that the Emperor's government had received satisfactory explanations as to the sense and bearing of the resolution, that the Senate had laid it on the table, and then added the gratuitous statement that in any case the executive power would not have given its sanction to it. When this publication arrived in Washington, the sensitiveness, which had subsided in Paris, woke up anew in the House of Representatives. On motion of Mr. Davis, the House requested the President to communicate any explanation which he might have made to the government of France, in reply to which he sent the entire correspondence of which we have given an abstract. The matter led to an angry debate and to the adoption of a report from the Committee on Foreign Affairs, written by Mr. Davis, in which he vehemently criticized the action of the President and the Secretary of State, but he did not succeed in convincing any considerable portion of the public that the course of the government had been any more lacking in dignity than in prudence. In the condition of affairs which prevailed throughout Mexico, no plebiscitum was possible. In most of the states of the Republic, the Indian population had never heard of the Archduke Maximilian, and everywhere outside of the French lines his adherents were found only in monasteries and sacristies, so that after a year of waiting, the Emperor of France was compelled to give up his favorite expedient, and intimated to the Archduke that they must be content with whatever sanction the Regency in Mexico could contrive. Senor Gutierrez de Estrada therefore appeared once more at Miramar, on the 10th of April, 1864, and with the same fluent rhetoric and ready emotion, informed the Archduke that he had been called to the throne by the practically unanimous voice of the notables, the municipal authorities, and the great corporations. Prince Maximilian, who had employed his leisure in the study of Spanish, 
replied to the deputation in that language, saying that the signs of adhesion to his cause in Mexico seemed to him sufficiently unanimous, that he was satisfied with the guarantees of independence and stability already secured, that the Emperor of Austria had given his consent, and that, relying upon the friendship and goodwill of the Emperor of the French, he therefore accepted the crown at the hands of the Mexican nation. He said, quote, she has placed her confidence in a descendant of that house of Habsburg, which, three centuries ago, planted a Christian monarchy upon her soil. This confidence touches me, and I will not betray it. End quote. He promised to retain the absolute authority given him, only so long as it might be necessary to introduce settled order into Mexico. He would start at once for his new country, only pausing on his way to visit Rome to receive from the hands of the Holy Father those benedictions so precious to all sovereigns, and which were doubly important to him as called upon to found a new empire. The Mexican imperial flag was at once displayed from the turrets of Miramar, and amid the roar of artillery from the castle and town, the deputation knelt and did homage to the new emperor. On the same day, a convention between France and Mexico was signed at the castle, by which the new government bound itself to the payment of 270 million francs for the expenses of the French expedition, 12 million more to satisfy the claims of French subjects in Mexico, and a further annual sum of 25 million in specie. Thus, with his kingdom in pawn to his powerful protector, bankrupt in advance, loaded down with a debt which he could not reasonably have hoped ever to repay, the ill-starred prince embarked upon his brief career of disaster, which was to be closed by an early and cruel death. While the Archduke was waiting for his crown at Miramar, he authorized the Confederate envoys in Europe to be informed of his strong sympathy with their cause, and his wishes for friendly relations with the Confederacy. He sent a message to Mr. Slidell that he considered the success of the South identical with that of the new Mexican Empire, in fact so inseparable that an acknowledgment of the Confederate States of America by the governments of England and France ought to take place before his acceptance of the Mexican crown became unconditional. Mr. Slidell was naturally astonished at such a communication coming to him unsought, and at first imagined that the person, Mr. de Havilland, who brought the message, might be a Yankee emissary. But on making his suspicions known to Gutierrez de Estrada, the latter confirmed Havilland's assertions as to his relations to the Archduke, and said that he himself had introduced him, and Slidell's agent in the Foreign Office afterwards confirmed what had been said of the value the Archduke attached to the recognition of the Confederacy. He said he had seen the paper in which the Archduke set forth the different measures which he considered essential to the establishment of his government, and that the recognition of the Confederacy headed the list. It was, therefore, with the liveliest anticipations that Mr. Slidell awaited the visit of the Archduke Maximilian to Paris in the month of March but it is probable that the Austrian prince had received from the Tuileries a caution against any commitment towards the Confederacy. For although he remained in Paris a week, and although Mr. Slidell sought an interview with him immediately on his arrival, the prince went away without giving an audience to the southern commissioner. This was a bitter disappointment to Mr. Slidell, and he tried to console himself with an absurd fable which he picked up at some salon in Paris, that Marcier had informed the Archduke that he had been authorized by Lincoln to promise recognition to his government by that of Washington, on the condition, however, that no negotiation should be entered into with the Confederate States. Quote, the Archduke, continues Mr. Slidell, is weak and credulous enough to think that he can keep on good terms with the Yankees, while he can at any time, in case of need, command the support of the Confederacy. End quote. Mr. Slidell sent to the Archduke, through one of the prominent Mexicans who surrounded him, an intimation that he was making a great mistake as to his hopes of avoiding difficulties with the North, and his reliance upon the South to aid him in meeting them should they occur, that without the active friendship of the South he would be entirely powerless to resist Northern aggression, that the motive of the Confederates in desiring to negotiate with Mexico was not the expectation of deriving any advantage from an alliance per se, but from the consequences that would probably flow from it in another quarter. Mr. Slidell did not indulge in any illusion as to the Mexican expedition itself. Quote, it is impossible, he said, to exaggerate the unpopularity of the Mexican expedition among all classes and parties in France. It is the only subject upon which public opinion seems to be unanimous. I have yet to meet the first man who approves of it, 
and several persons very near the emperor have spoken to me of it in decided terms of condemnation. The emperor is fully aware of this feeling, and is, I believe, very desirous to get rid of the embarrassment as soon as he decently can. The archduke may be obliged to rely on his own resources at a much earlier day than he expects. In this opinion, I may perhaps do the emperor injustice, but I cannot otherwise account for the evidently increased desire to avoid giving umbrage to the Lincoln government. End quote. Nothing more lucid or sagacious than these words was ever sent to the Confederate government at Richmond, and it would have been well for the Archduke if he could have heard and heeded them. On the 2nd of May, Mr. Slidell wrote again to Richmond, repeating his story that Marcier pretended to be the bearer of assurances from Lincoln to Maximilian that the empire would be recognized by the United States, and he reports that he hears, quote, from well-informed quarters that Maximilian, on his arrival in Mexico, will address a circular letter to the various governments with which he wishes to establish relations, that of Washington included, and ignoring the Confederacy. I have taken care, he says, to advise the leading Mexicans that such a course could not but be offensive to my government, and might lead to results which would hereafter be regretted, end quote. He took particular care to impress upon the mind of one of Maximilian's officers, who was to sail with him in the Novara, the necessity of the support of the Confederacy to protect the new government against the aggressions of the North. But when the Imperial party sailed from Civita Vecchia, there was little left of the high hopes with which the rebel commissioners had anticipated that event. Maximilian arrived in the city of Mexico on the 12th of July, and made his triumphant entry into the capital with all the splendor of ceremonial which was within reach of the French army and the Mexican church. But the enthusiasm of the occasion was confined exclusively to the foreign soldiers and the native priests. The people looked coldly on, enjoying the unwanted and brilliant show, but exhibiting no hearty welcome to their new sovereign. His first acts exhibited at once his goodness of heart, his purity of intentions, and his utter incapacity to understand or control the turbulent elements with which he was called upon to deal. He invited Juarez and his leading adherents to hold a conference with him in the city of Mexico, and offered them the most tempting positions in his gift, as a price of their adhesion to the empire. He received in return a letter from the Mexican president, couched in dignified and moderate language, but filled with an unflinching spirit of hostility and defiance, both to Maximilian and to Napoleon III, whom he considered his principal, which, when published, did much to encourage the adherents of the national cause. The Archduke then established several commissions to organize the administration. They did their work in a feeble and vacillating way, and shortly after his arrival, Maximilian found himself in an attitude of hostility to the church party, at whose invitation he had come to Mexico. Even before his arrival, there had been a breach of friendly relations between the church and the French authorities. The clerical party expected, as a matter of course, that upon the arrival of the French in the capital, their church property would be restored to them. But General Bazaine found this course impossible, not only on account of the exigencies of the public treasury, but also because many French citizens, the holders of ecclesiastical property, would have been ruined by its restitution. He therefore allowed proceedings in the courts in relation to such property to take their regular course, and when the Archbishop of Mexico protested against this action, his two colleagues in the triumvirate, Almonte and Salas, at the suggestion of the French commander, dismissed him from the regency. He protested loudly against this action, and, in company with the great ecclesiastical dignitaries of the country, issued a manifesto denouncing the acts of the French military authority and of the regency under it as no less tyrannical and unjust to the church than the proceedings of the Juarez government, which had driven the church party to seek for foreign intervention. The Archduke found himself confronted upon his arrival by this ominous state of things, and hampered by his dependence upon the Emperor Napoleon, he was unable to take sides with the church party, to whom alone he could look for sincere and loyal support in Mexico. Even the Pope, upon whose benediction and fatherly sanction he had built such hope for the stability of his empire, turned against him, and in a letter of the 18th of October, most affectionate in form, but severe in substance, informed him of the sorrow which his apparent recreancy to the church had occasioned at Rome, and of the hard conditions upon which alone he might expect the support and commendation of the papacy. Quote, 
the Catholic religion must, above all things, continue to be the glory and the mainstay of the Mexican nation, to the exclusion of every other dissenting worship. The bishops must be perfectly free in the exercise of their pastoral ministry. The religious orders should be re-established or reorganized, conformably with the instructions and the powers which we have given. The patrimony of the church and the rights which attach to it must be maintained and protected. No person may obtain the faculty of teaching and publishing false and subversive tenets. Instruction, whether public or private, must be directed and watched over by the ecclesiastical authority. And, in short, the chains must be broken, which, up to the present time, have held the church in a state of dependence its subject to the arbitrary rule of the civil government. End quote. These conditions were impossible of fulfillment. Maximilian could not restore the vast possessions of the church. He could not establish or maintain an absolute censorship of the press and of public and private instruction, and thus every day widen the breach between himself and the church party. It was equally impossible for him to meet the financial exigencies of the situation. It had appeared to him at Miramar that with $18 million, his estimated income, including all that was left to him from the proceeds of his first loan, he might satisfy the most pressing wants of his administration, with $4 million for the public debt, $4 million for the Mexican army, $5 million for the French army, and with $5 million more for public works and the government of the interior, he could get along for the time being. But he soon found it necessary to rearrange his budget. Instead of the $18 million of expenses for which he had provided, he was confronted by an estimate twice as large. $6 million were needed for the debt, $14 million for the army, $10 million and more for the public works and the government of the interior. He was driven to seek another loan in Europe, which was issued at a ruinous rate, complicated with the system of lotteries which produced but little money for the bankrupt empire of Mexico, and seriously discredited the tottering empire of France. It was only in the military department of his government that something like order prevailed. The disciplined army of Bazaine met with but little resistance wherever it marched, except from the diseases incident to the unaccustomed climate and the harassment of irregular bands of guerrillas. Many of the leading generals of the Republic betrayed their trust. Vidaurri deserted from Monterey. Uraga, general-in-chief of the army, went over to Maximilian. The government of Juarez fled from place to place, until at last he sought refuge in the state of Chihuahua, with an army reduced to a mere bodyguard of 2,000 men, still opposing an indomitable front to the invader, and refusing to listen either to the temptations held out by Maximilian, or to the persuasions of faint-hearted friends, who urged him to put an end to his own troubles and the distraction of the country by submission to the empire. So long as the new empire was supported by the arms and by the prestige of France, it presented to the world a certain appearance of strength. The president of the republic and the cabinet kept up a show of resistance in a remote frontier state, and the southern portion of the republic, where Alvarez held Guerrero and the adjoining states with his faithful army of Pinto Indians, was never overrun by the invader. But the court of Maximilian in Mexico appeared as strong as any of the governments with which foreigners had had to deal for many years, and one by one the European powers recognized the new empire and entered into diplomatic relations with it. The United States retained its attitude of reserve toward the imperial court and of outspoken friendship toward the harassed Republican government. Mr. Seward lost no opportunity of making known to the diplomatic body in Washington, and through our minister in Paris to the emperor himself, that the government of the United States regarded the empire as a temporary and exotic government in Mexico, and constantly reiterated his firm and friendly warning to France to bring its invasion of Mexico to a close at the earliest possible day. At the end of 1864 and the beginning of the following year, a rumor reached the United States that ex-governor William M. Gwynne, foreseeing the failure of the rebellion, was preparing an extensive scheme of emigration to Mexico, which was to serve as a refuge for the defeated Confederates, and doubtless also as a point of departure for further schemes of hostility against the government of the United States. There seems to have been some foundation for this rumor, 
although the details of this scheme were contradicted by the imperial governments of Mexico and France, and after the war closed, several irreconcilable southern generals and politicians, among them Price, Magruder, and Harris, sought the protection of Maximilian, and tried to carry out a scheme similar to that attributed to Gwynne. The great mass of the southern people, being tired of wars and wanderings, this seductive scheme of colonization came to nothing. When the Republican National Convention of 1864, which renominated Lincoln, met in Baltimore, a resolution was adopted, with long-continued applause, approving the position taken by the government, quote, that the people of the United States can never regard with indifference the attempt of any European power to overthrow by force or to supplant by fraud the institutions of any Republican government on the Western continent, and that they will view with extreme jealousy, as menacing to the peace and independence of their own country, the efforts of any such power to obtain new footholds for monarchical governments sustained by foreign military force in near proximity to the United States." End quote. This was a wider and more energetic extension of the Monroe Doctrine than had ever before been put forward in so authoritative a form by any body representing the majority of the people of the United States. It was adopted by Mr. Lincoln in his letter accepting the nomination to the presidency, though with his usual candor and caution he added that, quote, the position of the government in relation to the action of France and Mexico, as assumed through the State Department and approved and endorsed by the Convention among the measures and acts of the executive, will be faithfully maintained so long as the state of facts shall leave that position pertinent and applicable, End quote. But neither then nor at any other time was the government of France left in ignorance of the fact that the presence of their troops in Mexico was most unwelcome to the people of the United States, and that their continuance there was likely at any moment to result in disastrous complications. During the next winter there were two resolutions introduced in the Confederate Congress at Richmond, which, although they were not adopted, showed that a small minority, at least, of the rebel congressmen were opposed to the intervention of foreign powers in Mexico, and imagined that there might be a possibility of rapprochement between the Confederate government and that of the Union on a basis of united action against the French invasion. John P. Murray of Tennessee, on the 7th of November, brought in a resolution to the effect that, quote, we have no sympathy with the efforts to establish a monarchy in Mexico, and that we will not, directly or indirectly, aid in the establishment of a monarchy on the continent of America, end quote. And in the following January, D.C. de Jarnet of Virginia introduced resolutions with a preamble, setting forth that there were reasons to believe that ulterior designs were entertained by the imperial governments of Mexico and France against California and the Pacific states, which, quote, we do not regard as parties to the war now waged against us, as they have furnished neither men nor money for its prosecution, end quote, and resolving, quote, that the time may not be distant when we will be prepared to unite on the basis of the independence of the Confederate States with those most interested in the vindication of the principles of the Monroe Doctrine for their mediation, to the exclusion of all seeming violations of those principles on the continent of North America, end quote. Mr. de Jarnet, with foolish frankness, allowed his impression to appear, first, that the Pacific states might be detached from the Union for the purpose of attacking the Empire in Mexico in concert with the South, and secondly, that England and France would be so frightened by the policy indicated in his resolutions that they would give to the Confederacy all it wanted and more than it had hoped for. So long as Mr. Lincoln lived, the government of the United States continued its attitude of firm disapproval of French invasion, and after his death, when the fall of the rebellion had set free the armies of the Union, and had made the continued existence of Maximilian's empire in Mexico impossible, Mr. Seward, at the head of the State Department, still carried on with the same unswerving skill, dignity, and forbearance the policy inaugurated in the lifetime of Mr. Lincoln, until the Emperor of France, recognizing at last the failure of his scheme of a Latin empire in America, withdrew the troops which alone had sustained during those three years the power of Maximilian, at the cost of many thousands of lives and two hundred million dollars. And the unfortunate Archduke, with a courage and self-devotion worthy of a better fate, offered up his life amid the ruins of his short-lived empire. After the departure of the French troops, he retired to Queretaro, where he was immediately besieged by the Republican army. 
In the middle of May, the palace was taken, and a month later, Maximilian and his two generals, Miramon and Mejia, were shot, in accordance with the sentence of a court-martial. End of chapter 15 Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land Chapter 15 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 15, Fort Wagner the fact that the rebellion had its first violent outbreak at fort sumter indicated that place as among the first objects of attack by the national arms but as we have seen two years elapsed before any serious attempt was made to retake the fort and when made in april eighteen sixty three it resulted in failure after dupont's attack the confederates enjoyed two months of undisturbed leisure for the construction and strengthening of their works though all this time the matter of a new essay at the reduction of sumter occupied more than its proper share of the attention of the government the forces in the department of the south were not sufficient to undertake a siege of charleston by land and the exigencies of the more important campaigns going forward in virginia tennessee and mississippi prevented their being reinforced it was resolved therefore to restrict operations to the harbor and the islands immediately adjoining and admiral john a dahlgren after the death of admiral foote who had been designated for the purpose and general q a gilmore were charged with the command of the military and naval forces engaged the one was the most eminent officer of ordnance in the service and the other though young was already not only a famous engineer but also distinguished for his intelligence and enterprise in the command of troop the president was sure of the zeal and devotion of both and of their cordial disposition to work together harmoniously for the best results they indulged in no illusions as to the probable extent of their success in the undertaking before them general gilmore gave his opinion in advance that fort sumter could be reached and reduced or its offensive power entirely destroyed by the land and naval forces then serving in the department of the south provided there was hearty and energetic cooperation between them and the naval officer in command was one who had confidence in the monitors but that with the small force available about eleven thousand men the army could not initiate any movement of importance inland which would involve their leaving their advantageous position on the sea islands flanked by marshes on one side and the navy on the other admiral dahlgren had similar views he was ready to cooperate at all times with the army in any measures deemed advisable but never regarded it as possible that the navy alone could reduce the circle of forts around the harbor and take permanent possession of charleston he assumed command on the sixth of july gilmore had already been on the ground some three weeks and had nearly completed his preparations for a descent upon morris island when dahlgren arrived the admiral without a moment's delay entered into the plans of the general and within forty-eight hours collected his scattered monitors and steamed away to the harbor of charleston morris island is a low strip of sandy beach which lies to the south of charleston and with sullivan's island to the north guards the entrance to the harbor the two stretching out to sea like the open jaws of an alligator they are each about three and a half miles long separated from the mainland on the north and from the high ground of james island on the south by miry and impracticable marshes stretching a distance of two or three miles 
their inner ends are a little less than four miles from the charleston wharves with fort sumter lying midway gilmore resolved to make his attack from folly island which lies on the coast directly south of morris which it greatly resembles in conformation and from which it is separated by lighthouse inlet it was occupied by a brigade under general israel vogdes who had fortified the southern end of it controlling the waters of stono harbor and the approaches of james island there was a heavy growth of underbrush at both ends of the island taking advantage of this vogdes under gilmore's direction constructed ten powerful batteries near its northern extremity completely masked from the enemy's view their purpose being to operate against the enemy's guns near the landing-place to protect the debarkation of the troops and to cover their retreat in case of necessity most of this work was done at night and all of it as silently as possible during the last days the rebels were busily engaged in wrecking a stranded blockade runner within pistol shot of these batteries and never discovered them alfred h terry's division of four thousand and george c strong's brigade of two thousand five hundred were quietly brought together on folly island and on the afternoon of the eighth of july the former force was sent up the stono to make a demonstration against james island while strong's brigade was ordered to descend upon morris island at daybreak of the ninth colonel t w higginson of the first south carolina volunteers colored was ordered at the same time to cut the railroad between charleston and savannah a duty in which general gilmore says he signally failed the others punctually performed the tasks assigned them terry's feint against stono was so imposing as to be taken for the real attack by beauregard who hastily gathered together a considerable force to resist him and paid little attention to the serious movement on the beach there were still however enough men left on morris all in fact who could be handled to advantage but they were taken by surprise attacked in front by strong's brigade who crossed the inlet at daybreak and on their left flank by dahlgren who swept the narrow island with his guns they were speedily driven out of all their batteries south of wagner and abandoned to gilmore three-fourths of the island with eleven pieces of heavy ordnance the next day he ordered strong's brigade to assault fort wagner an attempt which failed with slight loss on each side on the sixteenth terry was attacked by a superior force on james island and although he repulsed the enemy with the assistance of the gunboats which accompanied him he was recalled to folly island the purpose of his demonstration having been accomplished although general gilmore had as yet no adequate conception of the enormous strength of fort wagner the assault and repulse of the eleventh of july convinced him that it could not be carried off hand he therefore determined on consultation with admiral dahlgren to establish counter batteries against it hoping with the combined fire of these and the gunboats to dismount the guns of the work and so shake its defence as to carry it by a determined assault the preparations were made with great energy and by the morning of the eighteenth exactly one week after the first assault general gilmore was ready for the second it was an ill-advised and unfortunate enterprise doomed to disaster from the nature of the case with all his skill and coolness and his profound knowledge of engineering gilmore was still young and daring and naturally inclined to think less than they deserved of obstacles in front of him he admits in his report that he was not aware of the tremendous strength of the sandwork he was attacking his information in regard to it was contradictory and meagre its formidable armament its full and disciplined garrison its capacious bomb-proof which could shelter the entire force in complete safety were as yet unknown worse than all this the maps of the coast survey upon which our army and navy relied implicitly had been rendered obsolete as to morris island 
by the stealthy encroachments of the sea which had almost gnawed the sand spit in two at the point just south of the fort leaving only about a hundred feet of dry land instead of the three hundred indicated by the maps and even this narrow causeway was subject to the washing of the waves in spring tide and heavy weather along this path of death an attacking force must march exposed to the fire of a fort stretching all the way across the island from the sea shore to vincent's creek presenting a front of three times the development which could be given to the head of a column of approach the terrible ratio reaching as high as ten to one as the sandy isthmus narrowed under the walls of wagner the batteries opened fire upon fort wagner from land and sea about noon and in a short time its defenders were driven from the parapets to the bomb-proofs the fire of its guns appearing to be completely silenced the flag monitor lay only three hundred yards from the sea face of the work says dahlgren not a gun was fired from it not a head was visible to my glass as i stood with other officers outside watching for the first symptom of renewed resistance cart-loads of sand were hurled into the air by every broadside in the course of the afternoon the whole work seemed to be beaten out of shape late in the afternoon gilmore formed his storming party to move at twilight this time was chosen that the column might not be distinctly seen by the enemy's batteries on the opposite islands general strong's brigade took the lead followed by colonel h s putnam's in advance was the fifty fourth massachusetts colored led by colonel robert g shaw one of the bravest and gentlest soldiers whom the north had sent to the war as the head of the column debouched says general gilmore from the first parallel the guns in wagner gregg and sumter and also those on james and sullivan's islands opened upon it rapidly and simultaneously and when it approached so near the work that the fire from the navy and from our own mortars and the gun batteries on our extreme left had to be suspended for fear of hitting our own men then a compact and most destructive musketry fire was instantly poured upon the advancing column from the parapet by the garrison of the work which up to that moment had remained within the safe protection of the bomb-proof shelter and now emerged therefrom to meet the exigencies of the assault from a front ten times as large as the head of the assaulting column this storm of death rained upon the devoted troops night had closed suddenly in unrelieved even by the light of stars for the sky was black with thunder-clouds the colored regiment in the advance led by the flower of massachusetts loyalty did all that could be asked of them they melted away rapidly in the darkness but still pushed forward dashing through the water of the ditch and climbing the parapet of the fort there their heroic young colonel fell shot dead among his foremost men and the decimated regiment streamed back to the rear carrying some confusion into the ranks of those following them strong's men rallied gallantly and supported by putnam's brigade they gained the southeast bastion and held it for several hours but ignorant of the interior arrangements of the work they could make no further progress and were being gradually killed at the enemy's leisure when about midnight they abandoned the hopeless contest and such of them as were able made their way back to their camps the loss had been extraordinarily severe besides colonel shaw general strong and colonels john l chatfield and putnam were killed or mortally wounded general truman seymour who had immediate charge of the assault was severely wounded and many other valuable officers were killed in general strong and colonel putnam the army lost two of its most promising and brilliant leaders equally eminent in character and attainments the death of colonel shaw 
was widely lamented not only because of his personal worth but because he had become in a certain sense the representative of the best strain of new england anti-slavery sentiment the confederates recognized this representative character by their treatment of his corpse replying to a request of his friends for his remains that they had buried him under a layer of his niggers general gilmore though powerfully affected by the waste and ruin of this unsuccessful assault began instantly to accomplish the work assigned him in another and a better way he had lost one thousand five hundred men in his gallant rush upon wagner and had inflicted comparatively no damage upon the enemy the heavy cannonade from land and sea had done nothing more than mar the symmetry of the thick walls of fine white quartz sand a few hours work by night could repair all the injuries inflicted by many tons of metal during the day the impregnable bomb-proof could shelter the full garrison one thousand men mounting the parapet at a given moment could hold an army of twenty times their number at bay advancing along the narrowing path of sand there was nothing to be done but to press the siege by gradual approaches and even this course was surrounded by most formidable difficulties the scanty isthmus twenty-five yards at its narrowest part and subject to frequent overflow by the tides was swept not only by the fire of wagner in front but by that of battery gregg on cummings point at the northern extremity of the island by numerous heavily armed batteries on james island and by the destructive plunging fire of fort sumter delivered over the heads of wagner and gregg the first preoccupation of general gillmore was the elimination of fort sumter from the contest even while his thinned battalions were retreating from their assault on the eighteenth of july he gave orders for the formation of a strong defensive line capable of resisting any possible sortie which was afterwards called the first parallel on the night of the twenty third he established his second parallel by the flying sap six hundred yards in advance of the first stretching his line diagonally across the island on a ridge of sand resting his left on vincent's creek which was guarded by a floating boom and extending his right by a barricade to low water mark terminating in a strong crib-work on which was established a powerful and novel arrangement of guns known as the surf battery at every advance he planted breaching batteries against fort sumter this part of the work being under the charge of major t b brooks a volunteer officer one of the most notable instances of which there were so many of extraordinary military capacity suddenly developed in young men whose training had hitherto been exclusively in civil pursuits admiral dahlgren gave his earnest co-operation in this work one of the most important of the breaching batteries was armed and manned from the fleet under the command of captain foxhall parker under the incessant fire of the enemy's batteries from front and flank these operations went on not satisfied with occupying every foot of the sand spit gilmore resolved to establish a battery bearing both upon sumter and the city of charleston in the deep mire of the morass separating morris from james island this apparently impossible task was successfully carried out nothing was left to chance every step of the work was founded upon careful experiment and scientific induction on a bed of soft black mud sixteen feet deep in a swamp overgrown with reeds and grasses traversed by winding bayous and subject to daily overflow by the sea waves a battery was built and immediately christened by the soldiers the swamp angel 
we will give general gillmore's description of this unique structure the marsh battery consisted of a sand-bag parapet with a return or epaulement of the same material at each end the whole supported by a broad grillage composed of round timbers in two layers crossing each other at right angles and resting directly on the surface of the marsh in this grillage in rear of the parapet there was a rectangular opening through both layers of logs exactly of the proper size to receive the platform of the gun and surrounded by closely fitting sheathing piles these piles reached from the upper surface of the grillage entirely through the stratum of mud into the solid substratum of sand within this rectangular space thus closely confined laterally by the piles layers of marsh grass canvas and sand were placed directly on the mud to the aggregate depth of several inches the sand being on top on the sand rested a compact sub-platform of planks on these planks the gun platform was placed the appalment and the gun were therefore so far independent of each other that the subsidence or displacement of the one would not necessarily involve that of the other on the ninth of august major brooks established the third parallel with the flying sap in advance of over three hundred yards and at this time the fire from the semicircle of confederate forts and from the sharp shooters in wagner became so incessant and so galling that general gillmore concluded that for the success of his siege operations against wagner it would be necessary to breach fort sumter and put an end to the annoyance of its fire he was not without hope also that after he had demolished sumter he might invest the island so as to ensure the fall of wagner and gregg he was compelled to wait a few days on account of the inferior quality of his powder but having been generously supplied by the navy he began on the seventeenth of august in concert with admiral dahlgren a furious and sustained bombardment of fort sumter every battery had its work assigned it the distances from the batteries to the fort ranged from three thousand five hundred to four thousand three hundred yards for seven days the storm of metal cast over that expanse of beach and water rained upon the fort until on the twenty fourth gillmore was able to report to the general-in-chief its practical demolition the barbette fire of the work was entirely destroyed a few unserviceable pieces still remaining on their carriages were dismounted a week later the casemates of the channel fronts were more or less thoroughly searched by our fire and we had trustworthy information that but one serviceable gun remained in the work and that pointed up the harbour towards the city the fort was reduced to the condition of a mere infantry outpost while this demolition of sumter was going on the siege work against wagner which had been checked for a while was again pushed forward on the night of the twenty first the fourth parallel was opened and five days later a ridge in front of it was carried by a bayonet charge and a fifth parallel established within two hundred and forty yards of the fort nothing now intervened between the besiegers and besieged but a flat ridge of sand twenty-five yards wide washed over by the seas in high weather this was found to be thickly planted with torpedoes and captured confederates said the glacis of the fort was also full of them in the midst of these hidden perils the sappers worked on and a single night brought them to within one hundred yards of wagner here they were brought to a standstill 
the converging fire from wagner alone almost enveloped the head of our sap delivered as it was from a line subtending an angle of nearly ninety degrees while the flank fire from the james island batteries increased in power and accuracy every hour to push forward the sap in the narrow strip of shallow sifting sand by day was impossible while the brightness of the prevailing harvest moon rendered the operation almost as hazardous by night a feeling of doubt and discouragement began to prevail when gilmore resolved upon a final and vigorous movement which ended the siege he moved all his light mortars to the front and placed them in battery brought his sharpshooters forward trained his breaching batteries on the fort arranged powerful calcium lights to aid his own men and blind the eyes of the enemy and secured the ever ready co-operation of the navy in a final bombardment of the rebel work at daybreak on the fifth of september the whole armament opened fire and for forty-two hours the soldiers were regaled with a spectacle of unequalled magnificence the mortars threw their shells over the sappers heads into the fort thirteen of the monstrous parrots one hundred two hundred and three hundred pounders sent their howling missiles at the angle of the bomb-proofs the new ironsides under captain rowan cast the ricocheting shells from her eight-gun broadsides over the hissing waters to climb the parapets and explode within the fort by night the union men worked with perfect security in the shadow while the calcium light showed them every inch of the enemy's works there was no withstanding such a fire as this the confederates fled to their bomb-proof gilmore's sappers pushed rapidly onward they were out of danger from the moment they had got so near to wagner that the james island batteries ceased to fire for fear of hitting their friends a feeling of exultation took possession of them the diggers off duty mounted their parapets and coolly surveyed the works of the enemy a few feet away which gave no sign of life on the night of the sixth the sappers pushed past the south face of the fort masking its guns and removed the pikes planted at the foot of the counter scarp of the sea front the way was now open and gilmore ordered an assault on the morning of the seventh but shortly after midnight the enemy left the fort and silently evacuated the island some seventy prisoners were caught in the darkness on the water eighteen pieces of heavy ordnance were found in wagner seven in battery gregg gilmore was surprised at the strength of the fort it exceeded all that spies or deserters had reported after the terrible bombardment it was virtually intact these operations were not carried on without a vigorous correspondence with general beauregard no one could entertain relations with that sprightly general either as enemy or as friend except at the cost of voluminous letter-writing on the fourth of july he considered it his duty to deliver an extended lecture to general gilmore in regard to the misdeeds of his predecessor he gave a graphic account of general hunter's administration his raids on the mainland his pillage of plantations and seizure of slaves he held up the noble example of napoleon who refused the aid of russian serfs against their government and demanded a reply from gilmore as to whether he proposed to continue the barbarian practices of which he complained general gilmore replied with judicious brevity that while he and his government would scrupulously endeavor to conduct the war upon principles established by usage among civilized nations he should expect from the commanding general opposed to him full compliance with the same rules in their unrestricted application to all the forces under his command it is hardly possible that general beauregard did not understand the meaning of this note but he answered on july twenty two pretending ignorance and calling for more specific charges 
a demand with which gilmore complied succinctly but definitely enough on the fifth of august saying that he considered the expressions in his former letter as pertinent and proper at the time they were written and that they had been more fully justified by subsequent events he then quoted the agreement entered into for parole and exchange of wounded prisoners and referred to the violation of this agreement by the confederates you declined he said to return the wounded officers and men belonging to my colored regiments and your subordinate in charge of the exchange asserted that that question had been left for after consideration he could only regard this action as a palpable breach of faith later in the month of august in the midst of the terrific cannonade upon sumter another interchange of warlike missives took place between the commanders the marsh battery the famous swamp angel whose construction has been already described having been completed on the twenty first of august general gillmore sent to the confederate general a letter demanding the evacuation of morris island and fort sumter and informing him that in case of refusal he should open fire four hours after delivery of the letter upon the city of charleston from batteries already established in range of the heart of the city this letter by inadvertence was sent unsigned and was at once returned and then signed and sent back after waiting fourteen hours instead of four the swamp angel opened fire throwing a few shots into the sleeping city by way of warning and exhortation the next morning general beauregard replied in words as furious if not so sonorous as the tones of the marsh battery he sermonized gilmore as to his duties under the rules of nations not barbarous he reminded him that wagner gregg and sumter were much nearer to him than charleston and seemed to think there was special depravity in firing on the city from a battery quite five miles distant an act indeed of inexcusable barbarity that the shots fired were the most destructive missiles ever used in war growing sarcastic he asked why he did not demand the surrender of all the forts and finally he solemnly warned his adversary that if he fired again on the city without giving a reasonable time to remove non-combatants he would employ stringent means of retaliation gilmore replied at once paying no attention to the excited rhetoric of beauregard simply calling his attention to the well-established principle that the commander of a place attacked but not invested having its avenues of escape open and practicable has no right to expect any notice of an intended bombardment other than that which is given by the threatening attitude of his adversary charleston had already had forty days notice of her danger the attack on her defences had been that long steadily in progress the object of that attack had been at no time doubtful if the life of a single non-combatant were exposed to peril by bombardment the responsibility rested with those who had failed to apprise them of their danger or to provide for their safety and who had refused to accept the terms upon which the bombardment might have been postponed general gilmore said it was his belief that most of the women and children had long been removed from the city on beauregard's assurance however that the city was still full of them he would suspend the fire upon it until eleven o'clock on the night of the twenty-third thus giving forty-eight hours for the removal of non-combatants from the time his first communication was received at the expiration of this respite the swamp angel again opened throwing her eight-inch shells over five miles of marsh and beach and bay into the heart of the frightened city the non-combatants poured in a continuous stream out of the town but little damage was done the famous battery built with such skill and care had but a brief history its great 
parrot gun burst at the thirty-sixth discharge and was never replaced though two sea-coast mortars were afterwards mounted in the battery to operate against james island on the night of the eighth of september an attempt was made by a detachment from the fleet to carry fort sumter by a coup de main this plan had occurred to general gillmore at the same time but the force he had detailed for that purpose was detained by low tide in the creek and did not get off until the sailors and marines had attacked and had been repulsed with severe loss in the darkness after this the army busied itself for several weeks in reconstructing the captured forts on morris island and turning their guns against the confederate works in the harbor on the twenty sixth of october the heavy rifle guns were opened once more against sumter and two monitors from the fleet joined in the bombardment which in the course of a few days cut down the southeast face of the work so as to expose the channel fronts to a reverse fire the debris soon formed a continuous and practicable ramp from the top of the breach to the water's edge fort sumter was now a ruin sheltering an infantry outpost but encircled by the other forts in the harbor which had been greatly strengthened during the summer and autumn it continued to be held by the confederates until sherman marched north from savannah in the spring of eighteen sixty five general gillmore had not troops enough to make a land attack upon charleston and admiral dahlgren did not think it possible with his seven battered monitors to move upon the formidable series of works which lined the harbor on every side he convened a council of his commanders of ironclads men of tried courage and intelligence who decided unanimously that forts moultrie and johnson could not be reduced by the navy without the cooperation of the troops and by a vote of six to four that the attempt to penetrate to charleston with the monasters would be attended with extreme risk without adequate results the bombardment of wagner and later the attack by the ironclads on moultrie had shown that the damage inflicted by the severest fire on such sand works was incommensurate with the great expense and risk the ironclads says dahlgren might steam in and make a promenade of the harbor suffering much damage and inflicting little then retire to remain in would only be a useless expenditure of valuable vessels which could not soon be replaced the only result therefore of the year's campaign was the completion of the blockade of charleston by the possession of morris island which gave a shorter line to the fleet and by the demolition of fort sumter which allowed more freedom of action to the squadron in the lower bay the mutual criticisms of the opposing commanders in this campaign are curious each thinks the other at fault general gillmore contends that fort wagner though formidable in construction was wrongly placed that after the primary error of abandoning cole's island which gave up folly and made possible the movement against morris the great mistake of the enemy was in not fortifying the southern end of the island and in placing fort wagner so near to sumter that he was compelled to witness the humiliating spectacle of the destruction of his principal work on an interior line over the heads of the defenders of an exterior one the special defence of wagner gilmore thinks was faulty in two particulars it was too passive not a single night sortie was made and second there was little use of curved fire though the two mortars they had seriously delayed the advance of the national sappers general beauregard on the other hand condemns gilmore's plan of campaign as a whole james island he says was the avenue of approach i dreaded the most to see selected it was in reality the entrance gate to the avenue which would have almost assuredly led into the heart of charleston 
the enemy preferred breaking in through the window and i certainly had no cause to regret his having done so but general gillmore insists that his force was too small to justify an attack by way of james island which was too wide for his small force to operate on and where he would have been met by superior numbers of the enemy on morris island however where the space was narrow his force was ample both parties there had all the troops there was room for the advantage was on the side which was superior in artillery afloat and ashore in engineering devices and in a steadily maintained initiative moreover he especially wished to demolish fort sumter and took the best means to that end, end of chapter 15.